Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed officials and delegates, members of the media and audience. I am Ishita Guha, and on behalf of National Skill Development Corporation, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you. We appreciate you taking time off your busy schedules to join us today. We hope that Charcha 2021 will be a learning and fruitful experience for all of us. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed the face of the world. It has caused massive dis disruptions, forcing us to adapt to innovative technologies and methods of working in a professional space. With this, the demand for skilled workforce has been on the rise. NSTC, which has so far positioned itself as a catalyst in India's skill ecosystem, intends to reinforce its role and responsibilities through Charcha 2021. We wish to bring together the sectors that will drive the development in India's skill ecosystem. We hope that Charcha 2021 enables a platform to create a sustainable future through skilling. On this note, and without taking more time, I would like to invite on stage the moderator and panelists for our first session, which is themed Skilling to Create a Future Ready Workforce. The panelists of the session are Pradeep S. Mehta, Secretary General, Cuts International, Lieutenant Colonel Shrikumar P. Manikot, retired, Chief Executive Officer of Prestige Property Management and Services, Dr. Srinivas Rao, Director, Apollo MedSkills. The session will be moderated by Shija Nair, who is the Senior Head Monitoring and Partnership Management at, Nat at National Skill Development Corporation. Prior to NSTC, she has worked extensively in social development sector in leading organizations such as the World Bank. She has also been a consultant for the Ministry of Rural Development, Government of India, among others. May I request Shija to introduce the panelists and kickstart the session. Over to you, Shija. Thank you, Ishita. Good afternoon, everybody, and warm welcome to the first session, Skilling for a Sustainable Future. Uh, I will quickly give a brief introduction of the session and then introduce my esteemed panelists who are with me here today for the session. So the objective of the session is to deliberate on building a sustainable future through skilling. It's important to invest in skilling and entrepreneurship opportunities, encouraging local economy and industrial production must also be accelerated in the country through skilling, upskilling, and reskilling of our youth. At the same time, it's imperative that we look at skills for a future-ready workforce. What are those skills that we are talking about? We are looking at skills like critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, and such. I would request my panelists to focus on this theme in their opening remarks. Once I quickly introduce all the three panelists, I will then hand over the mic to each one of you for a seven minute introductory presentation around the theme. My first panelist today is Mr. Pradeep Singh Mehta, the Founder Secretary General of Cuts International, Consumer Unity and Trust Society, which was established in the year 1983. Mr. Mehta has been advising governments and international agencies on matters of trade, development, investment, and competition policy for over two decades now. He is also a columnist for several leading newspapers and is a very well-known speaker. Currently, he is a member of CII's International Trade Policy Council. Welcome to the panel, sir. My Thank second you. panelist for the session today is Lieutenant Colonel Sri Kumar Retired, who is the CEO of Prestige Property Management and Services. Lieutenant Colonel Sri Kumar served in one of the elite regiments of the Indian Army, the four Gorkha Rifles, for over 25 years. He joined the Prestige Group in 1998 and has been instrumental in establishing their property management company. He comes with extensive experience in the construction industry. We welcome you to the panel, sir. My third panelist for today is Dr. Srinivas Rao, who is the CEO of Apollo MedSkills. Dr. Rao, a physician, comes with over 15 years of experience in the healthcare industry in India and across the world. Prior to joining Apollo MedSkills, Dr. Rao has led complex assignments globally with other organizations such as Apollo Hospitals, GE Healthcare, Siemens Healthcare, to name a few. He joined Apollo Med Skills in 2017 and is one of the leaders in the skilling revolution in the healthcare sector in India. Pleasure to have you on the panel, sir. 
May I now request the panelists to give their opening remarks, uh, seven minutes each, please. Mr. Mehta, would you like to start first? Can I can I go later, or do you want me to sure. start sure. first? Why don't uh, Why don't I then invite Dr. Rao? Dr. Rao, do you want to go uh, first and give your opening remarks on what Absolutely. you think? Absolutely, uh -huh. definitely, Shija. I think uh, uh, the topic itself is quite uh, timely. I think um, enabling sustainable future for skill development. I think uh, when when I thought of this, I think there are four critical focus areas. I think that we need to keep in mind to sustain the future of skill development. And uh, I think one is the, the the focus should be on demand driven and industry led models. So. Today, the skills that match the skills, the uh, matching the skills demanded by industry and the skills supplied by the training sector, they should have, they should have a very linear match. The second area to sustain uh, the future in skill development is actually to focus on skills application rather on the theory. While most of the programs are, have that component of uh, training, then on-job training as well. I think there should be particularly. I'm speaking with a focus on healthcare because. Here, the human touch and tactile elements play a very crucial role in the efficiency of the um, healthcare resource. So, focus on skills application rather than the important critical factor for sustaining the future. The third is, I think, the skills should be scalable and flexible. So, I think we should create that environment infrastructure that will enable this scalability. I think, thanks to COVID, that has definitely given us the power of technology and uh, it just accelerated that effort and we started delivering e-learning and blended learning models, which is good for the scale. And fourth, very critically, I think all the skills that we deliver should be nationally and internationally recognized. Today, I think there are gaps in this area which need to be addressed uh, by the governments to recognize the skill development programs, to have a vertical integration to the formal education systems and the university education system. So these are the four uh, areas. And in addition to that, there are three layers that should that will ensure sustainability. One is, of course, ensuring a financial sustainability through innovative models. Um, so it is very important to have that financial sustainability. Today, most of the skill development programs that we run are either 100% government funded models or 100% funded by a CSR agency. I think we should start innovating these funding models for ensuring financial sustainability. The next is the employment and livelihood sustainability. While we focus on most of the skill development programs, monitoring ends at third month of a job or six months of job, or maybe some of them focusing on an year of follow up after the job. I think employment and livelihood sustainability is super critical to ensure that um, there is a future uh, sustenance in the skill ecosystem. The, the final one is very, very critical, which is very industry focused and sector focused, which is outcome sustainability. For example, I, I'll just give an example of healthcare. We have seen during the pandemic, there are 15 lakh nurses who were on the field in the front line in India, across India. Out of the, I think, 26 lakh registered nurses in the Indian Nursing Council, 15 lakh uh, better in front line and similarly close to 35 lakh doctors were in front line but we should also uh, give credit to almost 20 lakh healthcare support workers who were also there in the front line and uh, thanks to the skill the skill india movement that has started uh, almost a decade ago which has really put on a lot of resources uh, almost 30 lakh resources who are support workers like phlebotomy technicians doing rt pcr tests a um, lot of uh, general duty assistants, assisting nurses, home health aides, ensuring there is a proper care delivered at home. Uh, definitely, they have complemented the healthcare ecosystem during this pandemic. So broadly, these are my initial thoughts, Sija, and I'll share more as we get along uh, during the course of the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rao. You've made some very important points. We'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Shri Kumar, would you like to go next to share your initial thoughts on what you think uh, are required for uh, skilling for a sustainable future? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good evening to you all. Uh, I will uh, restrict uh, my uh, points, uh, my thoughts, 
primarily on to construction and post construction industry absolutely that's right uh, uh, people oriented and uh, uh, it's a huge uh, migrant labors involved in that uh, as you see in last uh, two years world has seen uh, how pandemic has changed our life we have seen the impact on the economy we have seen witnessed uh, failure of the administration administrative machinery in tackling the crisis especially in healthcare front we have seen vulnerability of the society especially aged and sick pandemic changed the power dynamics we realized robust society backed by efficient administrative setup is essential for disaster management at the same time the positive side of side is the country as a whole united gathered strength and within no time we we could uh, control the situation ideas and resources poured in alliances collaborations started uh, started and succeeded and grappling in the situ grappling the situation and it is continuing as you are aware now from the human resources point of view we could see an enhanced focus on employee well being employee engagement and as much for emphasis on skilling reskilling and upskilling the honorable uh, uh, prime minister sri narendra modi ji outlined his vision for skill india by emphasizing that the government has declared war on poverty and determined to win and pm also mentioned each poor underprivileged youth is a soldier in this war i am coming from that connect when it comes to construction and post construction industry the majority of the works workers are underprivileged or poor there is huge dependency on migrant laborers by this industry lack of skills skill in construction and post construction care is a concern now from the point of view prestige group alone is engaging for our and pan india operation 20000 workers at any given point of time and it is mainly focused in south india but uh, we are a pan india operator at the moment there is a shortage of skill manpower almost every category of construction and post construction uh, uh, vertical and challenge lies in the entry level and mid level sometimes at senior level also and if you see that there is no pipeline that organization can this kind of an organization can tap easily almost all low entry level jobs are filled by the people who do not have the qualified or required skill and hence on the job on the job training is the only way to address this issue we don't have a culture of trade school schools like usa or other european countries are having it this means we have difficulty in getting access to trained tradesmen like masons carpenters welders specialists kayan uh, workers fabricators society uh, uh, safety specialists especially during construction time technicians and and the uh, more then at the school and colleges level education does not skill our students for the future the, this result lack of skill trained resources even post construction care post construction care vertical is primarily supporting the occupants of the building and it is it is primarily the facility management and then the property management in many western and some south asian countries as well we get a, we get qualified engineers or qualified management uh, specialist in fm is an fm degree is that is facility management degree is recognized but in in our country a very few institute not a renowned institute are not having this uh, curriculum in in case uh, engineers or iit graduates coming out having not having educate skill and they are not exposed to practical or, or, or uh, environment and functional functional competencies competi uh, competencies of uh, especially in in building uh, industry mep hvac system dg operation troubleshooting various uh, uh, other facilities which are lifeline as far as the people living or people utilizing the, these buildings skilling the workforce is an answer companies like us are engaging only class 1 contractors who are like lnt like jmc they are all listed companies they have their own training institution so they train 
they board them then they supply to uh, companies like us to undertake the work so that is that is very very limited and the huge workforce many companies they cannot afford that so in the market uh, the, the skilled laborers are at at premium now we should uh, we should recognize we should have recognized institutions in the country to cater for skilled resources and and we can sustain since we don't expose students and trainees during school college or vocational uh, training or critical thinking methods or how to troubleshoot or problem solving or collaboration and technology these are completely these uh, students coming to coming and joining the industry are totally unprepared so that that's a disadvantage construction industry is growing in a rapid can i can i just interject here uh, uh, yeah, i think i would i will i would like to stop you here because you will now then go into the questions that, that follow up questions that i can come up with so yeah, thank, you, thank you for the introductory remarks I would request other speakers to be on mute to avoid the echo that we are getting. Now, can I go over to Mr. Mota for your Thank introduction, you. sir? Thank you very much, uh, uh, and I'm glad that uh, I uh, quite uh, a lot echo what uh, Dr. Shinivasra spoke about, and some of those points I'm going to repeat. Uh, uh, These are very important points. Uh, Colonel Shikumar uh, gave us a very good uh, roundup of the construction industry and you know, the bigger picture. Uh, but let me start with, you know, Shija to speak about five constraints and what is it that we need to do in order to address them. Uh, number first is there are multiple structural issues uh, which uh, which making it ineffective for the target beneficiaries and inefficient for the state to run. And therefore, the overall system is ignorant to the intended objectives. I mean, that is something which, I, uh, with due respect to uh, your corporation as well as the ministry, uh, with whom I've been interacting for a long time. And mind you, one of our work areas that we do uh, in the context of competitiveness is the build up and sustaining human capital. Uh, human capital are three important critical components are health, education, and skilling, and not just health and education. So therefore, I uh, have we have this sort of understanding in terms of field work as well as policy research. Now, as of now, there are five main pillars of skill training system that are entrenched with multiple challenges. The first being vocational education in schools. Uh, something is happening, but uh, it's too, too little and too late. Second is the industrial training institutes, uh, both public and private. The third is the voc vocational training providers funded by your corporation and relevant ministries of the government of India, including private enterprises carrying out enterprise-based training, which includes apprenticeship. You know, there was a lot of confusion about the apprenticeship, if you remember. And in spite of the uh, government saying again and again, uh, those of you might know that in, uh, we have uh, a diploma uh, system in engineering, uh, which AMIE, that means if you're working on the job, you can then study for AMIE and become a graduate engineer. Now, those are the kind of things we need to revisit. A lot of people have forgotten about it. Now, let me, uh, this is one very good example, a very good study, which is sort of committee was set up under Sharda Prashad to review the sector skills councils. And uh, they suggested that vocational and educational training is not a stopgap arrangement for people who cannot make it to the formal education system. And that is what where there was a kind of misunderstanding. Instead, it is for the entire demography at large. And mind you, I mean, we have a high demographic dividend, probably the highest in the world. Now, the report also advocated for policy convergence, which, as you know, is, is a serious problem in our government. Policy convergence doesn't happen across all branches of the government. People still work in silos. Now, uh, one, for example, Sharda Prashad's committee recommended that we should reduce the 
sector specific uh, sector SSCs from 40 to 21. What was done? It was only reduced from 40 to 39. Now, where's the need for, you know, not following the full recommendation of the committee because of the lack of understanding? Which it only, you know, reinforces the uh, vicious cycle of pol policy paralysis. The second is the what are the challenges in the institutional framework? There's a need to shift the paradigm from supply driven skill ecosystem into an effectively operating demand driven ecosystem, what was voiced by Dr. Srinivas Rao as well. Now, secondly, and more importantly, it needs to be decentralized at the state and district levels for achieving a realistic market intelligence of how the Indian workforce's demand will look like in the coming years. At the same time, at the top level, we still have to even think about what skills will become outdated. If you're looking at industry revolution, industry four, then what would be the new skills required? Are we prepared for that? We are not, unfortunately. I don't think there is a serious thinking going on even in the NSDC or the ministry as well, or even the other relevant ministries, uh, DIPP, for example. Now, as highlighted previously, uh, <clears throat> the vocation and education training, as well as sector-specific councils, suffer from serious handicaps. There is a lack of synergy between the components of the VETS. Now, can we not think about a decentralized framework of primary training centers that operates in close coordination with district industry centers? with the help of local finance and capital, which can be a more efficient alternative. And this is, again, a part of a general problematic in the country. Our decentralization is very poor in spite of the fact that our uh, Honorable Prime Minister has been speaking about it uh, constantly. Now, additionally, uh, <clears throat> sector-specific councils are supposed to be industry-driven in their operations. They lack the optimal industry representation. There is a namesake representation, but it's not optimal. And these skill councils, they work currently work in a fragmented manner, working in silos to maximize their own surpluses. Can I uh, can I just stop you here, sir, and we yeah. come back to our? Can, can, can I just two more points to make? Uh, this is just two more points, and then uh, we can stop there. Okay, quickly. Secondly. Uh, <clears throat> Even in terms of planning, <clears throat> the SSCs are outsourcing it to external consultants who often rely upon knowledge from Australia or Canada and conveniently ignoring the Indian context while framing them. This criticism is also very extremely important. Finally, the ecosystem that empowers industry, particularly SMEs, develop their own in-house skilling and training system and the external institution like ITIs and NCVET can provide the necessary inputs to them for achieving the marketary skills required to operate and flourish in clusters. Mind you, when you have, if you have to reach out to SMEs, you have to have a cluster-based approach, otherwise it is too fragmented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. Uh, you've raised some valid points. Some of it <coughs> we'll cover in the questions, the follow-up questions that we have. Uh, not all of it may get covered uh, because we are also mindful of the time. I'll start with you, Dr. Rao, with two questions. Uh, you can either answer them one by one as, or I could list out both the questions to you. So my first question to you is, uh, you know, skilling in healthcare is critical uh, for India and for the world, uh, more so now because of the huge demand that's been can I request others to mute their mic? Uh, Mr. Mehta, could you please mute your mic so that there's no uh, echoing? So I was saying okay. healthcare we'll skill is critical for India and uh, the world in view of the high demand that's been generated you know, uh, due to the pandemic. What do you think are the key innovations that can drive sustainability in the healthcare skill uh, development space? And my second question to you is, uh, you know, Apollo Med Skills has been around working with government and private uh, uh, skilling systems for the last eight to ten years. Uh, what changes, if any, in your opinion, are needed in the PPP models for building, uh, you know, sustenance? Those are my two questions to you. 
Thank you. Thanks, Shija. So I'll answer one after the other quickly. Um, I hope I have about four or five minutes for this. Two answers. Yeah. Okay. So I think, uh, yes, healthcare skill development is super crucial now. While well, uh, in, in 20, 2017 estimates, the need for healthcare resources was 7.2 million in India and uh, close to about 22 million across the world. I think the equations have completely changed now. Uh, with uh, the number of resources requiring more. I don't have the numbers, but definitely the, the numbers will be larger than what uh, were estimated in the past. So there are uh, four or five key drivers uh, for healthcare skill development. I think the first one is the flexible learning models. Um, when I say flexible learning models, so uh, the blended learning has to be encouraged in healthcare. While the tactile skills are important, I think you need to give a small portion of e-learning so that the student understands this. The, the advantage of uh, uh, giving this blended learning is the student gets a more understanding about the subject before he comes in, before he comes to the center. So if there are any dropouts or if there is any uh, misalignment with what they thought and what they want to learn, this happens remotely. So it's a huge saving of cost both to the governments as well as to the uh, project implementation agencies. And it also gives more flexibility to the student and uh, PIAs, and there is a financial optimization, as I said. Well, and the second element on the flexible learning model that I mentioned is well, skilling for employment and self-employment are the two areas that were at center stage as of now. But I think upskilling and reskilling is super critical. As we see, most of the resources that were trained in healthcare, including doctors, nurses, I'm not just talking about allied health and support workers, they uh, they became obsolete because there are only four specialties in medicine that get trained on ventilator, that get trained on oxygen usage. These four specialties are critical care, anesthetists, pulmonologists, and respiratory therapists. Other than these four, other resources are not trained on how to use a ventilator. But the pandemic has necessitated everyone to learn. So I think uh, similarly, if you come to not such a complex skill, but if you even come to a ground level skill of managing a um, quarantine room or uh, isolation rooms, uh, then uh, managing oxygen cylinders, managing uh, uh, even vaccination drives. These are simple skills that are required in, in the current uh, stage. And we, we need flexibility of upskilling and reskilling. So the government has to come up with a upskilling, reskilling policy soon. Uh, that will sustain the employment. So I spoke about financial sustainability and second is employment sustainability. If most of the GDS, the general duty assistants or nurse assistants trained, they became obsolete during COVID because they haven't learned oxygen management skills. They don't know how the rational use of oxygen. They don't know how to manage a vaccination drive, as I mentioned. So I think upskilling and reskilling at every level is critical and we need a policy for that. The second very, very critical factor, which is a human factor, uh, which is not much spoken about in most of the forums, is the mindset of the students. I think this is very, very crucial to the success of any skill development project. The students have to be properly groomed at school levels. Uh, Dr. Mehta has already mentioned about vocational education in schools, but it is not just vocational education, but I think they need to be taught about human values, taught about when government is funding you for some initiative, this is for a national cause. There should be a military level discipline in the skill centers. There should be a commitment from the student to migrate and join jobs. They should, we should uh, in, include elements of human values and traditional systems into uh, the school education and vocational education. Because otherwise this, there is a consideration, there is a, a feeling that this is another freebie from the government, but they are rather than looking at it as a platform for self-improvement and national contribution. I think this is a second crucial element for sustenance of skills, which is a human element. The third very critical element that may give seriousness of that, that will definitely give seriousness to the students is building career ladders. Today, the students certified from short-term skills, they do not have any credit carry forward systems. Suppose if a three months course has a four, 10 or 12 credits that carry forward to a university system or a college system, then that will enable them a lateral entry into the program. It may not be a large lateral entry, but even at three months, or it, it should give an additional points for admission into a college or a university level program. 
without this the certificates will become obsolete obsolete in the sense at least in their sense they feel that the certificate has no value in taking it forward for a higher education so when they aspire for higher education i think building this career ladders and credit systems are super critical for sustenance and i though i spoke generically uh, it applies to healthcare it applies to every sector and i spoke about financial sustainability already but i think all the new pias that are onboarded into skill ecosystem by any ministry i think they need to be trained and guided on uh, ideal budgeting skills because most of the pias miss the bus including the larger ones in, including us when we started the skills they miss the bus because of lack of ideal budgeting skills in um, skill development program so uh, if players lack the financial management skills then they will falter in a year or two so i think this is these are critical lessons learned and uh, these are helpful for sustenance um this the more uh, important points uh, on the public private partnership what we have learned uh, one thing i think uh, while the public private partnerships have evolved and strengthened over the last decade uh, the government support systems are also strengthening i think there is still a lack of cohesiveness and inclusiveness because the pias are partners in implementation right and most times they need to be handholded and supported when they fall down uh or there is a large deviation in the uh, execution numbers but i see a lot of penalizing approach from the monitoring agencies uh monitoring agencies should become solution providers not problem finders they should not give a list of 20 problems until you resolve them then we will not move forward i think that adamant approach should go out in public private partnerships i think it is not from the government but by the mid agencies that monitor the projects so i think there should be some level of flexibility there then there should be quick decision making for example e learning policy is the need of the hour now so i think quick decision should be taken in skill development particularly how e learning policies have to be implemented this needs to be formalized finally flexibility to the pis i think uh, while there is a national occupational standard given by ssc's ncbt curricula we should follow the the pias should have a flexibility to follow 80% of the national occupational standards and there should be a flexibility for implementing 20% of their own curricula which the industry demands are because of the changing dynamic scenario so this will help in addressing issues such as chronic mismatches between skills acquired to actual skills required in the workplace i think in interest of time i'll i'll stop here but i hope i have address two points that you have asked thank you yes yes thank you thank you very much uh, couple of very interesting points there uh, particularly on the flexibility to tps that has uh, and pias that's been discussed in the ecosystem for some time uh, also your thoughts on ppp models and you know budgeting training for tps uh, and pias uh, entities that enter the skill ecosystem not necessarily come with skills of running a, a, a business so to say so those uh, very important recommendations thank you thank you so much uh, i'll come back to you uh, can i now go to lakshmi kumar shri uh, kumar uh, can i ask you a question specific to your industry uh, you'll agree that the impact of covid 19 was felt as much in the real estate sector and the conduct and the construction sector so how do you think the real estate sector has responded to this crisis and what are if in your opinion what are the two biggest lessons that uh, the construction industry has learned as a result of the covid pandemic clearly focused on skilling skilling what lessons have you learned you're on mute sir can you hear me yeah yeah thank you uh see but uh, one important aspect of what we learned uh, during this pandemic uh, like i mentioned it is dependent on migrant uh, laborers so there was an exodus uh, in the initial uh, lockdown so what uh, what has happened was that uh, we also realized it over a period of time uh, the industry uh, many others would have also done it there is we, we got into a backward integration backward integration means that there are lots of products which is required and where we are dependent on uh, various other uh, uh, sectors so we started uh, making our own uh, for example there are building materials 
we have created our own factory then uh, trained the people and brought them back given them housing given them uh, uh, facilities vaccinated and then uh, got into action so backward in integration on materials and finished products also for interiors then we also created our we do have our own uh, uh, horticulture uh, development work for uh, nurseries where we we ourselves created to be ourselves planned uh, all these things so by the time the buildings are ready and uh, this is uh, taken care that is one important point which i would like to highlight is that backward integration second one is the digital literacy now the digital literacy why i say is that uh, the entire industry is uh, 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 now the scenario has changed people have uh, uh, contactless uh, uh, um, activities whether we have access control whether it is elevator whether it is you talk about any machinery everything is coming like that so there is a requirement of the entire uh, uh, workforce learning that so that is one area where we uh, uh, got into skilling and uh, train the people imagine uh, in the in the work from home scenario the number of uh, uh, home delivery food and online uh, 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 stuff coming into the uh, uh, gate and from the gate there is no other entry because of restrictions and covid pro protocol and uh, covid appropriate behavior imposed by the government so those uh, people uh, the frontline uh, guys are the one who has to uh, take it uh, sanitize it and then take it so that is that's again uh, we got into the uh, uh, training and uh, manage and then people every one today is uh, capable of uh, using a smartphone and uh, managing the entire traffic whether it is uh, uh, people or the vehicle traffic and various other complaint management system everything is digitalized so the digital literacy is the uh, next important thing and as far as the uh, executive levels and some of the supervisory levels also we we embarked an e education uh, that e learning and entire curriculum which is uh, uh, as far as the construction industry is concerned with, with the uh, um, institutions which is available in india and abroad we could uh, Uh, get those uh, thing uh, get, get those curriculum uh, formed and we got into the e learning so as a result our executives and supervisory staffs are also picked up a lot and uh, their performance has improved that is that's the only way to sustain this uh, skill and there is there is no shortcut to that there they will have to continue skilling reskilling and upskilling that is that's the only answer and uh, there is a couple of things which i would like to add to that thing is one is that the training uh, that has to be there are there should be targeted training for short duration especially in industry like this and then over a period of time yes refresher and all those things primarily that that will give them the upskilling capability then uh, another one is the new uh, way to train the by partnering with vocational institution <laughs> Uh, Dr. Shri Srinivas also mentioned, Mr. Pradeep Mehta also mentioned. That is also there, and we do have an in-house institution uh, similar to that for our own staff. That is another area we are we are uh, focusing in. Then skilling the uh, that mapping the skill of the our uh, staff so that some of them have the capability. We can take them on to multi-skill level, and some of them can uh, realign in. based on their aptitude and their liking then the other one is what i would like to mention is that uh, it's a very important thing uh, from our point of view the industry bodies uh, let them drive change change that is like nascom has done it for it industry we can have a, we have credai we have ifma we have cii all these agencies can drive and yes of course it is like we cannot expect the always the government to fund it but there are uh, corporates there are mnc's who will as csr or even the concerned industry itself can fund it to a large uh, extent and uh, then have a national level uh, uh, institute which will give us certification after the training so that there is a standardization whether some A, a, a person getting trained in one region of the country and uh, somebody else from a different region the syllabus is the same 
so that there is a standardization when they come and join that thing they know the job they are all at par so these are the my thought on this thing so uh, thank you thank you thank you very much uh, some crucial points that you've made there i'll come back to when i circle around at the end with some common questions for all three of you particularly on you know uh, you know the uh, digital literacy and some of the skills that may or may not be possible to deliver online so i'll come back to that can i now go to mr mehta um, uh, one important question sir that i want to ask you is everyone talks of bridging the gender gap uh, under different skill training initiatives uh, however from what we have seen and read during the pandemic this gap has only further deepened the you know pre existing inequalities and uh, a study by cmei has estimated that about 49% of the total job losses uh, up until november 2020 were there of women so what you think are three steps that can be taken to narrow this gap and get more women back to work just three steps hi right. thank you shija uh, see the one has to understand this question in the context of uh, the current circumstances as we saw during the uh, the migrant labor and this probably the biggest migrant labor uh, movement anywhere in the world more than uh, nearly 200 million am i right or 20 million uh, i mean the huge uh, now naturally what happens is that it is the men folk uh, who stay behind some of them and the women folk uh, go ahead and uh, go ahead. so you have this kind of disparate uh, exit uh, from the existing jobs or even the jobs uh, which uh, went uh, which were shut down I mean, there many factories retrenched many hotels retrenched etc etc particularly hospitality sector we saw this very massive retrenchment happening everywhere at all now what would be the three steps uh, for this Uh, one is uh, that can there be some incentive slash disincentive disincentive scheme in order to help employers uh, to engage women and if they don't then what should be the disincentive uh, that is necessary the second step is uh, uh, now there are already organizations working for women's welfare specifically like seva in ahmedabad and they have Uh, got a lot of experience of dealing with this kind of problem uh, if at all there was a gender discrimination in retrenchment or job losses uh, or what have you now i i can't think of a third step beyond what i have suggested uh, one is to see the actual situation what is happening b is to find a kind of a carrot stick approach uh, uh, to deal with this issue that look this has to be done as it is you know you have gender budgeting going on so there is a lot of thrust on uh, gender importance but shida let me uh, uh, mention that you know i spoke about constraints that we face today and i have a few suggestions which i think is important for me to share in terms of how do you resolve them uh, we, we just don't talk about problems we talk about solutions as well decentralization let me give you an example of one of our field work that we did in kalimpong sgs sg women were trained to make achar and that is what they were doing the market had shifted to uh, ready to eat foods now they were not given those skills to make ready to eat foods uh, which should have been given to them i mean this is a small example symbolical but this is what we have found in many places around the uh, around the country uh, we have done uh, uh, grass grassroots level work in terms of finding out as to why uh, worker welfare is so poor now secondly uh, i had spoken about what we lack in our government generally speaking is a systems approach and here we had i had suggested earlier was concerned that we require an intra and intersectoral systems approach there are a lot of learnings we can get from the medical profession the health professional or the construction uh, occupation you know all the very good uh, uh, experiences that we gathered which many of these experiences as was rightly said by dr shrinivas raw can be applied across sectors they are not necessarily i mean they are they are, they have been tried tested and tried in a particular sector but you find that they can be applied elsewhere as well 
Now, an important thing, and this is a, a radical suggestion we are making, that we need to understand the extent of automation. This is what we found in the textile sector. Many units had turned to automation, and they were very proud about it. That look, we've been able to get rid of labor. Now, what I fear, as I said earlier, Industry 4 is going to lead us to much more many situations which you can't even imagine today. And therefore, I had also spoken about one dimension, which is that are we, are we, are we sort of skilling the person to deal with those new requirements, or are we skilling for the, the current requirements? That is one question. The second is, do we need, do we need some kind of regulation? That look, you will not, uh, you will not get rid of jobs for the, for, and, uh, because of automation, and so many jobs uh, required. There has to be some calibrated movement in this context, so that there is less of jerk and less of distress. The fourth thing is that you know the synergy of <clears throat> stakeholders and policies. Again, with the golden principle, what the government has been talking about: minimum government and maximum governance is also required in the skilling uh, and training uh, uh, Next is wet interventions. Again, I'm reiterating should be de should be designed on a demand-driven point of view rather than on a, <coughs> a desk design. Now, governance and administrative stability and accountability is very important as well. What we find, this is a serious problem in our administrative uh, system. And these are the people who have delivered many of these goods. I'm talking about secretaries of labor, employment, skills, et cetera, et cetera, and many stadiums. There is no, there is no <coughs> surety about their tenure. Two months, three months, somebody comes, learns on the job, goes. There is an MOU with the cabinet secretary, with state governments, that you will not move an officer earlier than two years unless there is an extraneous circumstances. Sir, point noted. I think, uh, I think I'll... Finally, finally, and this is again reiterating what Dr. Rao very rightly said, and this is what uh, we have also been talking about, is behavioral change to change the mindset. <clears throat> now, the other day I was talking to a farmer's son. He doesn't want to go into farming. He wants to get a government job and sit in the secretariat uh, doing a clerical job without understanding that, you know, what his father can teach him in the farm would pay him better, would give him more job satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there is a problem which has been happening again. I mean, this is not farming only, but many such uh, sectors where traditionally uh, the children were supposed to be you know, trained by their parents, uh, whether it is uh, fisher, fisher folk or uh, gems in jewelry, artisans in Jaipur and so on and so forth. Noted. Yeah, the mindset change required, the I'm going to complete here, is uh, again to reiterate what Dr. Rao said, is that we require a mindset change for them to understand the dignity of labor and to view work with a sense of duty and pride. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I did have a follow-on question uh, that was common to all the panelists on, you know, asking whether it is possible to do all the future skilling that we talked about on an online mode, or will it need children to come into classrooms? But I'll put that on hold. I'll, I'll quickly uh, talk about one or two takeaways that have come across from all of the three speakers. And I think it's important to recognize that, uh, you know, everybody has adapted and adopted technology as a medium to deliver skilling, skill training, and that's that's a positive that has come out in the in 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 the last couple of months, a year and a half that we have seen during the pandemic, gives us the hope that going forward we will be able to bring in these future skill requirements and match it to what the demand is. We will be able to do that. That is a positive messaging that's coming about. Another important point that I want to quickly summarize is what uh, Dr. Rao made. That is, it, it's important to it's important to create. Uh, uh, or inculcate in school going kids that that you know that national pride the value for the money that the government is putting it investing into your skilling i think that's also an important point that we have to read again mr mehta also touched upon it and so with that i would no, like I, to i was talking about dignity of labor yes and dignity of la labor again very important point so i'd like to thank all my panelists here because i can see that uh, you know we have gone 1 minute over the time that was
was allocated to us. Uh, uh, thank you very much to all my three panelists for sparing their time and joining this session one of Charcha 2021. Thank you to Team NSDC and to Team Nudge for putting this together. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very interesting discussion. Thank you, Dr. Bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.